Dr. Michael Rimfro, <coughs> Professor of Biology at James Madison University, and also Dr. Carol Wilkinson, a Professor at Virginia Tech. Uh, they are going to join us in the panel discussion, and they are already here. And also, I'd like to uh, ask Mr. Jason Amatucci, Executive Director of uh, Virginia Industrial Health Coalition, uh, to join the panel. And uh, at this point, I'd like also to thank the Virginia Industrial Health Coalition for sponsorship of uh, this field today and uh, for their financial support. And with that, I'm just going to give uh, Dr. Rimpro and Dr. Wilkinson five minutes each to summarize uh, about their research work on industrial hemp, and then we'll open it up for, for questions uh, from the audience to any of the speakers or to all of them. Thank you, Jess. Thank you. I'd like to thank Virginia State University for inviting us to this and for hosting this uh, event. I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and talk briefly about the research going on at James Madison University. We've been evaluating five different cultivars over seven planting sites. Uh, <clears throat> they cover between 40 and 50 acres, so uh, we are looking at field production. We've been assessing whether we can use conventional agricultural equipment to do that or not. Uh, out of our uh, oil seed cultivar, we have produced biodiesel. Uh, we've used the uh, press cake for seed meal for uh, animal uh, consumption and then uh, processed the fiber for animal bedding. So we have examined uh, downstream processing a little bit. We're also in talks with uh, potential uh, corporate partners for downstream processing. JMU, although we are not a land grant university, that does not mean we don't know how to do field research. Uh, people tend to overlook us as a player in the game here, but JMU is very much a leader in the uh, industrial hemp research in Virginia, and uh, we've chosen to follow a model of public-private partnership. Uh, for the 2018 growing season, we've had at least 18 serious inquiries with people wanting to partner in our research program. So again, uh, we may not have the benefits of uh, the land-grant universities, but we are a major player in the hemp research game. and. Uh, uh, right now we have the largest area of uh, land in hemp cultivation uh, among the various schools. So uh, we continue to plan, uh, plan to continue our uh, cultivar evaluation and look at uh, different uh, strategies for uh, field scale cultivation. Uh, as has been mentioned, the biggest challenge here is the lack of opportunity for processing, for doing something with the product once we've grown it. So we very much need a a decorticating plant or other facilities in Virginia and North Carolina is moving ahead with this. We're going to be left in the backwaters if we don't get busy and uh, connect the two ends here. And so I think the idea of cooperatives and other things that have been mentioned here um, uh, speak well for the future. And I think we need to, to look at this and uh, we need to get the two ends connected as quickly as possible and move industrial hand forward in Virginia. Thank you. I'd like to echo Dr. Renfro's comments about thanking Virginia State for hosting this and for giving me the opportunity to participate as well. At Virginia Tech, I'm actually director of one of the agricultural experiment stations. We're in Ottawa County, and there we're doing fertility tests on just one variety, Felina 32. I have a colleague, Dr. Fike, in Blacksburg who's doing variety trials and planting date trials. And we have a graduate student with us here today who's actually looking at pre- and post-emergent herbicides to see what we can use. For the trials we've been doing when we have problems with weeds or insects, we actually look to Canada and look at what they're using there. But then we have to go through the process of getting those labeled, hopefully once hemp becomes legal to grow in the U.S., but we'll have that information to get us started. Also, I would like to uh, recognize uh, Dr. Michael Timpo from University of Virginia, and uh, I'm going to give five minutes if, to say what he's going to do about this. Uh. Thank you. I, I think I'm a late addition, but I want to echo what my colleagues at JMU and Virginia Tech um, said. It's wonderful to be down here at Virginia State and to see what's going on with the Industrial Hemp Research Program down here. 
this is our first year at Virginia being involved in industrial hemp. And, and we're a little bit different focus than, than perhaps the other groups. Um, we're working with proprietary material that was supplied to us by a corporate partner. Uh, this is material that is, um, has been adapted for growth in the United States. It's non-European material. What we have the, is the ability to seed save and do selections. And so we have the opportunity to actually look for things that are quickly adapted to growth here in the state of Virginia. We're growing in three locations this year. We're growing in Hanover County. Uh, we're growing up in Albemarle at Morven Farms, which is right next to Monticello, so Jefferson could actually see some hemp growing if he were still around. And we're growing down at UVA Wise, where we're, we're looking at phytoremediation and soil reclamation, so we're looking at the possibility for selecting varieties that will grow on really marginal soils and, and re invigorate the uh, southwest of the state uh, in order to put it back into agricultural productivity. Um, one of the other activities that we have, and, and I have to say it's, it's been a, an interesting activity dealing with the DEA over the ability to do both industrial hemp and medicinal marijuana research, um, is we have lines that we're working with uh, primarily in the greenhouse now that are uh, high CBD uh, lines um, and looking at the, the medicinal aspects of, of uh, industrial hemp. And actually we'll be partnering with our Brain Institute to look at the potential for using some of these lines for treatment of things like epilepsy and, and cancers. And so we're looking at a, a broad spectrum of activities from field research to high intensity greenhouse research for specialty types of uh, industrial hemp crops to actually medical applications. And so, uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, I'll open for discussion to the audience, and please use the, the mics, and there are two of them. Okay, my question is this. Is it legal in any state? That's one question. And the other question is, if it's not legal in any state, are you growing 950 acres of hemp, or are you growing less? And if you're growing it, what are you doing with it? What am I missing? <laughs> the, this is working. Okay. Uh, in Kentucky, we have a restriction of what has to stay in the state. A viable seed cannot leave the state borders. And any of the floral material, that being the flower, leaf material, cannot leave the state. That's our restriction. Once we process and handle the stalk, any of the oils that we squeeze out of it, the meals, any of those that are processed, it's allowed to leave the state, as long as it's right for germination. That's the reason, one, for the germinating seed, not being able to leave. The second part is floral material, of course, it looks just like its cousin. If it's pulled over in a vehicle, and of course the dogs will alert to that too, based on the smell. So that's why they restrict that to the state of Kentucky. Anywhere we transport any of our items, we have our license that is, off, that is issued by the state of Kentucky. Kentucky used to operate under a memorandum of understanding with the Department of Agriculture. Now we are to the permit level. They passed a new law this May that we are under a permit or a license to grow. Okay, so, now that's you and your farm. Is that the entire state? The entire farmers? state. And it, it is legal. Is that correct? That is correct. All right, so Kentucky. Who else? What other state? Colorado. Okay. There's Oregon. The, there's uh, third. Now, states. how y'all... How y'all get around federal regulations in Virginia's in the back seat on this? What am I missing here? Why are, are we asking, legal if y'all are legal? Are you asking about the legality so, of growing hemp? Yeah. Yeah, so there's 33 states that are legal in the country. My name is Jason Amatucci, by the way. I founded the Virginia Industrial Hemp Coalition in 2012. We are working on this, these policy issues. Uh, we're educating the public and adv advocating for the hemp crop, but at the same time, we understand that the biggest roadblock to all this are the laws. That's the first thing we have to change to get all this going. So, 
here's, here's the clarity of it. it. It's very kind of, there's a lot of gray area right now, though, in the laws. So we have the Industrial Hemp Farming Act, which is right now, which is going to take the Industrial Hemp off of the Controlled Substance Act. But what has been done in 2014, the Farm Bill has legalized industrial hemp research from state ag departments and universities to go through a licensing program, right? So it comes off the Controlled Substance Act when you are going through that process. So that we are able to grow it and have a license through our Department of Ag, which has decided with our laws, works through universities at this point. Now we are working to, with them and everybody to maybe open this up to everybody so that all farmers can get a license directly and work. But right now we're working off the farm bill law. It's very important to understand. That's how we're able to do all this, right? So that's the national law. But the, also the state laws have to be congruent. So we had a state law in 2015, Senator Dance, that was a part of that. And that opened up all the research. So, and yet all this is changing by the minute as well. So it's, it's a very complex question you ask in a way, and it also is changing. So the rest of us are suffering because of the ignorance of some of the politicians that don't know the difference between hemp and marijuana. Well, that's, that's changing a lot right now. Actually, we've got a lot of people that have come around on that issue. And we, Bob Goodlatte is, is part of a bill that we worked on and with uh, James Comer in Kentucky and Jared Polis. And a lot of people have, uh, and Thomas Massey, this is the best opportunity ever to get industrial hemp legalized in Washington, D.C. But, of course, the climate now, nothing's getting passed in D.C. Um, so that's where we're at with that. So we can import millions of dollars worth of product and not grow it in this state and in this country. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's actually very aggravating. That's asinine. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's like you say, it's just a change. Not to make too fine a point of it, but <clears throat> technically the Agricultural Act of 2014 did not legalize hemp growing. It merely prohibits the Department of Justice from prosecuting those of us who do grow it under a state-sponsored university research program. So uh, they can't come after us, but, but it's not really, it's not legal now. If the bill that Goodlad is co-sponsored to, if that passes and it's delisted from the Controlled Substances Act, then it will be legal. Which is Bill 3035. <laughs> Yeah, 35. Yeah. So you need to call 3530. And, right. 3530. Call your people in Washington. We've got three co-sponsors already in Virginia, um, uh, Griffith and Goodlatte. Um, and so we, we've got Garrett. to actually, and Garrett, Tom Garrett. Um, and we got to call everybody and get them to put pressure on, on our congressmen and get them to push this forward, make this an issue, put this front and center. This is a jobs bill. And then you can call Frank Ruff here. Uh, Rosalind Dance and Tommy Wright and put the pressure on them. Speaking for myself, you do not have to put any pressure on them. Uh, first one is for um, Dr. Renfro. Uh, what is the qualifications for the consideration? to work with the school right now uh, to be one of the uh, part of the research program. And that being said, the uh, ongoing research is done mainly by schools that are offering just agricultural programs in the university, uh, or are other universities also available to participate in the research program, just not on an agricultural level uh, due to it being used for research going to be now researched in medical schools uh, for the cannabinoids that are in the plant uh, that could possibly help with epilepsy and uh, various nerve uh, issues and, and, and brain illness. Um, or is that strictly just an agricultural thing at the moment? So currently most of the research that's going on is agricultural based. As I said before, James Madison is not a land-grant university, nor do we have an agriculture department. I'm with the Department of Biology. But again, we know how to do field research. We're very involved in this research program. Um, <clears throat> we started out with two participating farmers. We've expanded that to four. We plan to expand that again next year. Again, uh, we had, uh, uh, as I mentioned, we had 18 serious inquiries of people wanting to partner with us 
for the 2018 planting season. Now, we won't be able to partner with all of those, but we're going to continue to expand the program. The, the provision is that we direct university-based research. So what we're doing is we're partnering with farmers to allow them to have a piece of the research puzzle and <clears throat> let them follow an experimental design that we set up so that they help through the use of their knowledge, their equipment, their fields, they help us address these research questions that need to be answered. One of the things we've been looking at is can we use conventional agricultural equipment to grow this. There are some challenges because you're harvesting, even if you're harvesting for seed, you're harvesting uh, the plant when it's much greener than most conventional crops. So you're going to have some issues there. Um, we haven't seen quite the problems that others have with, with insects and birds. A lot of that, I think, has to do with timing of harvest and that sort of thing. So we're learning a lot by um, following this public-private partnership model that we're using because we're relying on expertise and existing knowledge of experienced farmers. Uh, and we're developing the experimental protocol. They're helping execute the experiments. And so far, that's working very well. Um, in fact, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Glenn Rhodes and Brian Walden uh, as two of our participating farmers. And uh, so this is a model that's working well. It's a model we hope to continue and, and hope to expand the program. As we get people that are interested in downstream processing, we want to be uh, in a position to scale very quickly so that we can start providing material to those processors. Uh, we've been looking at it for oil and fiber. Again, we produced an oil seed crop. We were able to put that through a press, produce biodiesel from that. The uh, press cake, the seed meal, uh, went to uh, feeding livestock, and the uh, stem we shredded and used for animal bedding. So we've already been able to demonstrate the feasibility of producing uh, crops, three different, uh, three different crop products from the plant using conventional equipment. Um, as far as the uh, medicinal and pharmaceutical um, end of it, we're not looking at that uh, at this point in time. Uh, we may expand into that, but I'll let Dr. Kimko uh, respond to that portion because that's uh, an area that... that uh, and one other thing, really quickly, gentlemen, at the end. Actually, every year. It's every year. So it's not just getting it done once. Like if I get a job in Virginia, they go through a background check, I'm good for the rest, the rest of my time. It's every year we have to go through the background checks, which takes up time. And it so many times. Really quick, one more question for the gentleman at the end. Um, you said you are currently working with some universities for the medicinal aspect of the plant, correct? No, I, I am the university doing Oh, that. great. Um, so you're, you guys are still not allowed to keep the seed, right? The seed still has to be destroyed? Um, no, we actually, the, the seed that we're working with does not have any MTA associated with, with it. That was part of the arrangements we've made so that we can grow our seed, we can save our seed, we can select our seed in the field. Uh, what we're hoping to do down in southwest Virginia is actually we've got material planted on the mining reclamation, so the seed that grew down there this year will be replanted next year. We don't have a problem with that. Okay, and what seed variety would that be? What's that? Seed variety. Uh, I, I can't talk to you later about it. Okay, but thank you. Hi, I have a question about the legis legislation. Um, where are we at with the bill? So the bill is written, yes. correct? Yeah, it was just uh, submitted actually a few weeks ago. Um, it took a long time, a process of a lot of getting consensus building and, you know, Bob Goodlatte's chair of the Judiciary Committee. So we had to really work with him because any bill with cannabis has got to go through the Judiciary Committee in the House and the Senate. So it's really huge that he's a part of this bill, um, and now we're going to see some daylight get it into a committee. So the next step is we put pressure, we get co-sponsors, we get pressure on everybody to make this, to put it in front of the committee to make it an issue. Then it passes the committee, and it goes through the process, then it goes to the floor of the House. Then if it passes the House, uh, they'll, and they'll have another bill over in the Senate that they'll get going, and they'll have the same process over there. So we really need to... 
you know, call our congressman and make this an issue and say, you know, we've got to get this done now so we can, Virginia can take advantage of, the, of this. Well, hopefully they've been educated quite a bit, you know, yeah, I mean, financially. Sure. Yeah, benefits. we've been working really hard on that, our organization as well, and a lot of organizations across the country, um, national organizations. So, but it really, you know, when you, you get 10 phone calls, if we all got on the phone and got 10 phone calls, they're going to hear about it and they're going to say, oh, my constituents want me to really, you know, push this. and co-sponsorship is a good way of getting that up there so once that number gets high they say okay we're, we're gonna we need to get this bill going through is there a date a projected date as far there as isn't any projected date right now and also we're also working with a, a bill with Virginia that's going to open up this more to Virginia farmers make a much easier process maybe eliminating the background checks doing some of these things to streamline the process deregulate and really get our farmers you know in, in the in the game so there's two bills state bill okay and then there's a federal bill okay, so we all the it, there has to be the congruency of both you have to have the state law that legalizes hemp as well right and then you have the federal law which will de take it off the control substance right, I get that but I mean right now for us it's mostly the state bill like Kentucky went ahead and you know did their own thing we have they a didn't wait on the feds to do something we do have a state bill we have like 2015 we have one in 2016 we passed one as well for opening up commercial we're waiting for the federal uh, bill to pass and then we're, uh, we're gonna revamp it's contingent on the federal bill then exactly and what we're gonna do now is is go back to the drawing board and try to, to deregulate even more the regulate see right now everything has to go with the university and for that's the way the laws right. are written in 2015 so what we want to do is we want to open this up to farmers directly how Kentucky's doing how North Carolina's right. doing where they can actually directly license from the uh, agricultural Department of Agriculture. Oh, okay, so. so that's the problem is that we're waiting on the feds to, to try and do something. But yeah, and we also need to shore up our, our Virginia state laws as well and, and get more behind it. Yeah, I mean, it, what we need to do is follow Kentucky's example in the 33 other states and take the reins and just go ahead and and not wait on the federal government, I guess, to do the deal. Well, I mean, for the for the industry to move to the next level, we've got to have that federal law. But, like, you know, the, it does say notwithstanding the Controlled Substances Act and the Farm Bill. That's the first line. So it does take it, in a way, off of the Controlled Substances Act when you are working through the process. Um, it takes it off of the Department of Justice and sort of that area. They have to get DA permits because they have to import the seed. So they have to have a 357 uh, import uh, permit and then and that's why the DA is involved. But if we could get domestic seed, if somehow we had you know domestic seed, um, that would be really great. And but once the Control Substance Act comes off the Control Substance Act, now we can get that. There are, is feral seed in Virginia, like uh, Craig Lee was talking about the Kentucky heritage. We do have you know feral seed in Virginia. It's a lot of some of it's in the Williamsburg area still because they grew a lot you know in the old days there. Uh, Excuse me. What I wanted to ask is, I'm trying to understand. You know, you have hemp, you have marijuana, and uh, they both seem to have great economical advantages. They also have uh, medicinal and agricultural advantages. And you know, you also have you know, the end user like myself that can use some of these medicinal uses in the state of Virginia, which is not legal yet. And with all these positive things going on for these both of these products, and then you have opiates that's popping up every day with all these side effects, how is it that the legislation is allowing that sort of thing to continue on and continue the, to ignore the natural uh, gains from both of these processes? I, I, I seem to be missing something. Uh, Probably has to do with patents and owning property and a natural plant you can't own it and that's probably the boils down to the root of your of your issue um, but you know that's that's something that a lot of people are saying the same thing that's a question and to add on to what Jason's saying right there the answer to that is basically follow the money um, yeah, yeah. there is a lot of money uh, in pharmaceuticals um, hemp or marijuana can potentially uh, be a danger to those uh, companies um, so Unbeknownst to us, I am sure that there is plenty of lobbyists, if you will, that do not want to see hemp or marijuana come to the forefront uh, because of the industries that they're currently in. Um, that is just an educated guess, but I also went to Arizona State, so leave, take it as you will.
It's also, it's also a matter of, of continuing to educate our elected officials, uh, particularly in D.C. I've, I've heard comments that they're hesitant to delist him because they're afraid it's going to interfere with law enforcement. But um, in the farming community, we know there are very different cultivars of plants. Right? And industrial hemp is very different than medical or recreational marijuana. They have a different phenotype, they have a different morphology, they have a different chemistry. And unfortunately, the current federal legislation lumps them together because they're the same species. But as I've pointed out before, that's, that's like saying I can't tell the difference between broccoli and Brussels sprouts because they're the same species of plant. They're vastly different cultivars, and <clears throat> law enforcement, with very minimal training, can easily distinguish between industrial hemp cultivars and medical or recreational marijuana cultivars. They look different, they behave different, the chemistry is different. We can develop field testing kits uh, to easily distinguish those. So that should not be a barrier. We need to, we need to make sure that our representatives understand that this is a different crop, that it is not the same as marijuana, and that is not going to be a barrier to law enforcement to continue to uh, enforce uh, laws regarding uh, illegal substances. I have a question. Can you tell them about if you grow hemp and you try to grow marijuana in the hemp fields within five acres of time out of an acre of hemp, that it will pollinate and you will not have any blood from the marijuana so the, the point he's making is that since they are the same species, they will easily cross-pollinate and hybridize. So a marijuana producer is not going to want industrial hemp anywhere within five miles where the pollen can contaminate and then the seeds that would come off of that would be greatly reduced in their THC content. Uh, medical marijuana is currently producing around 20 to 30 percent THC content. Industrial hemp by law has to be less than 0.3. We're using certified seed. Ours came back last year less than 0.1% THC after testing. So that's another thing. If, if in the state, if we use certified seed from reputable companies, I don't see the need to continue even the field testing uh, that, that they currently require. Those are very expensive analytical tests. That's a burden on the farmer. If we're talking about trying to get something that's going to be field production, we can't be layering on licensing and criminal background checks and THC testing and all these other expenses that you don't bear for other crops. So if we use certified Woo! seed, Ooh. if we use certified seed and you know, reputable growers, uh, we need to remove some of these uh, administrative hurdles if we're going to move this crop forward and, and get it on a production scale in Virginia. And I think we're People in Colorado and most of the other states had to go to the polls to vote for this special whatever that's going on. The people in Virginia, are they supposed to go to the polls too and say, let's vote for this and let's vote for that? Yeah. No? That. No, we don't have that system. We have to, all of our laws go through the General Assembly. We don't, uh, they, they can act, the General Assembly can actually put that law up for our vote. But, but they, do, they did it in Colorado with ballots and, you know, petitions to get their, you know, get it on the ballot we can't we don't have that system in Virginia um, so that's kind of why you know our hands are tied we go through all of our laws through the General Assembly but the, but what what Mike's saying is is every a lot of people are in agreement with that I mean I don't I don't know how many people that really they're saying open this up everybody just says let let's grow this because the key to this is the marijuana laws haven't changed so if somebody is growing hemp and said they're growing marijuana but they are growing hemp they're still under all the laws of you know they still have they still get in trouble and you know all that is still there so you can do all these safety measures to stop someone from doing something but you already have that backstop with the marijuana laws we have now uh, Jason let me let me let me clear up something being from Kentucky you know everybody says you know and I've heard this because I'm involved in a lot of states I'm not a grower but I do have my own seed variety I understand growing the crop but each state wants to race against the other state 
Let me tell you what, Kentucky, the reason why that we're ahead of most people is because our activism in 1993. In 1993, we started this whole thing. So figure it up, we're 24 years. And so the commission that Jamie Comer overseen, it was already set up in 2001. 2001 is when this commission was set up, and it was set under up under by the governor's task force. So this this process, which it took a whole legislative session, well, matter of fact, it took three legislative sessions to get the commission set up, and it was set up in 2001. So go all the way back three years. It was 1998 is when we started in Kentucky, and so this is when Commissioner Comer grabbed a hold of this several years later, then it was, that was not what I did in Kentucky, is to absorb all of this information. And at one time, our organization in Kentucky had more information on industrial hemp under one roof than any organization <coughs> in the entire world. And so, when Jamie Comer come up on, on board of this, I give him the minutes to the meetings that we had 12 to 14 years before. So, this is not a race. People in Kentucky want to race against North Carolina because North Carolina is a very progressive state in the union. But each state, in my opinion, it needs to be responsible for its own infrastructure and cert and make that economic indicator. Tobacco in Kentucky was a seven-time indicator. Hemp can be a seven, eight, ten-time in uh, indicator depending on where you're going to put it at. So this is why Kentucky is somewhat uh, ahead of, of, of you guys but we're all playing on the same field under the farm bill. We're all playing under the same umbrella. But the race is not with who's first or who's ahead of this. And I hear it in North Carolina, and I'm going to be speaking to some people out of South Carolina and Tennessee next month, about 350 people in, in Asheville, North Carolina. And I don't, I, I don't like to see the race. You know, I like to see what the universities is doing here underneath the umbrella of the farm bill to move this thing forward. And it's not a race, you know. It's, it's working together to make what works for Virginia, what works for Kentucky, North Carolina, or whatever state's involved. Right, right. Gentlemen, instead of, uh, instead of uh, racing and universities and et cetera, et cetera, have you guys ever given thought to forming a coalition uh, of all of the agribusinesses and government uh, concerns that are trying to grow the economy and suing the federal government, the DEA, whoever it is, that has taken a, a, a plant that is not a class one and decided for politics to, dis de to declare it something that it is not. If I declare a glass of water a brick, I can't build a building with it. It's actually been done, the, re the lawsuit, uh, but re recently. That needs, that needs to be the focus, like the Manhattan Project, or the, uh, yeah, the Manhattan Project or something. You guys need to form a coalition to browbeat, sue, whatever, just like the pharmaceutical companies, just like the automobile industry stopped uh, converting to metrics because they didn't want to go from the standards system because they had tooled up for it. They didn't want to go to metrics like the rest of the world. If this is going to ever happen, it needs to happen based on the common sense and just browbeat them into stop reclassifying a glass of water into a brick. There's uh, there's actually a couple lawsuits actually right now. Uh, DEA, Department of Justice, has been, has been sued on this exact issue. Yeah, if you look at the criteria for what constitutes a Schedule One controlled substance, hemp does not meet any of the criteria. Well, and the, and the federal government themselves admitted it in the in the court case against the DEA when they were back in 2001. They tried to make hemp foods illegal just the food itself, no THC in it, and they had a big lawsuit by the HIA. They lost that lawsuit, and in the uh, judgment of the federal court, they said that this does not fit the definition of a controlled substance. It has to have a strong uh, potential for abuse and um, no medical value. Well, we know that that's completely wrong for both of those things on him. So 
The key here is we're all abiding by erroneous federal law. Everybody, we're all abiding by it, um, but it's it's wrong. You know, if here in the here in the state of Virginia, we did research back years ago before this crop was ever legal. Most people weren't even thinking about it, and so the stalks and things that I've talked to previously that we got from Canada, we did research in tobacco redryers. And that tobacco redryer and the destemming process of the tobacco can work into this. It might need to be retooled. I've noticed that some of the CBDs out of Kentucky, they're taking the leaves and the bud from it and they're grinding it up from tobacco redryers and destemming processes. So there is a tooling process here in Virginia. It's just finding that company or that or. The equipment we used was old, but it worked. They were still using the tobacco in there and everything. The gentleman was 74 years old. He said, come up and run hemp through this and see how it works. So we went up to there. We, we, we run it through the facility, and then we took the fiber. After we got the fiber out of it, took it about 200 yards down the road to an old uh, knitting facility, spinning company, that had been there, the name of it was January Woods, had been there since the 1800s, and we cottonized hemp on 1925-year-old equipment, and it took us all day. I didn't know a doggone thing what I was doing, but I learned through the process. At the end of the day, we had cottonized hemp that the gentleman who owned the plant blended it with cotton, and the next day called us up and said, come and pick up your yarn. That was within 24 hours. We took it from stalk, the destemming process to the yarn, and we come back with yarn like you would knit a sweater or something with. It was rough, but it did happen, and it happened in 36 hours. It's how much ground pounding you're going to do. You cannot do this, people, through the internet. You're not going to be able to do this through the internet. It won't work. You can't process it through the internet. Only thing you can do is talk about it and get confused. And I've done been down that road. I had some people one time call me up and they got talking about industrial help. Okay. Then next thing you know, I'm on, I'm off on CBDs. And then the next thing I'm off on is fiber. And I said, will you wait a minute? I said, you got me going in 25 different ways. And I had a lot of people calling me from around the United States. I don't have that many calls now because a lot of people have gotten over the issue. But the infrastructure right here in Virginia with your tobacco companies, the destemming, the retrying processes, all this, the warehouses, it's laying empty. This is your continuity of supply. This is where you store this year's stalks. This is where you take it to. It don't matter if you don't have it a thousand pounds. It means not having nothing to start with. Amen. And some of the CBD people in Kentucky, that takes their, they take their buds off, they strip the stalk, they take their buds off and the leaves, and they put it in their processor and extract CBDs. So I was talking to the gentleman one day. I said, you know something? It's hard to find clean cellulose. That's what the stalk is. It's 80% cellulose. I don't care about the fiber. It's called, the fiber can be hemicellulose, but the crop itself, the stalk. So I said, why don't you take it, once you get through, go get you a tobacco baler and bail up these stalks which are so clean they didn't come out of the field with weeds in them and bail them up and have them ready for production. He said, what an idea. They started bailing their stalks up. Matter of fact, he sold the bale of stalks, called me up the other day. He said, you know what I got out of my stalks, my 60 pound bale? For research now, a dollar a pound for research. So the thing about it is, if in the research process of this, if you don't have anything for the industry to research, you're left out in the cold. So you've got to start with something with that continuity of supply and the universities is a way to do it and through cooperatives, like the gentleman said, to reach out to these agribusinesses and reach out to the universities through a cooperative, a strong cooperative for farmers that really want to do something because I'm going to tell you what, it's going to, hard, going to be real hard to get the money you need to build the infrastructure unless you work with legislators and, and doing uh, crop research through Virginia, uh, through your universities, through the farmers and the cooperative or some organization that's strong enough to be able to say, hey, we mean something. And that's what it takes. And the thing that is, why, why it's so easy for Kentucky 
We started with the Kentucky Hemp Growers Cooperative Association, which is formed in 1941, and we had it, it was a farmer organized co op until they outlawed it and, and, and made us go out of business. And so here we are back here to Squire One, and there's a lot of people looking at this as an individual effort of moving forward. I'm going to tell you something. As an individual, this is going to be very difficult. And as an, <laughs> and, and as an individual, so as a cooperative and a group of people, just like the gentleman who clears up the air on the agricultural equipment, there's a possibility the equipment can be used to a cooperative or several cooperatives. You know, several. Have them regional cooperatives. And that way you've got regional business, regional uh, regional universities working with you. And you can clear up a lot of these questions and a lot of these answers by getting an organization formed for a think tank. Back years ago when I was involved in this, we had think tanks. And it wasn't just hippies. It was people of industry, business, everything, 15, 20 people to get together in one house with a lot of water, not some place where you got to leave. We're going to be here all night long. And we had think tanks, and this is how we come up with the different ideas. And the commission was formed. It was passed well before Jamie Comer got a hold of it. So some of the legislation and some of the races, we've been involved in this for a long time. So Kentucky would go way back when we formed the commission. And then Jamie Comer just happened to say, hey, I'm willing to reinstate the commission and get it going. And so that's 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 where we're at in Kentucky. Thank you very much. Um, so um, there's repeated mention of protection based on the Farm Bill, um, allowing uh, research through universities and state directed. Um, is there any uh, threat that that language will be stripped um, or will expire, similar to what they're uh, threatening to do with that medical marijuana language? So is that something? No, no this, is a, this is actually a permanent part of the Farm Bill. Um, I believe they're going to revisit some of that language and maybe improve upon it uh, for the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, but hopefully, we'll have Industrial Hump Farming Act, hopefully by then, to we won't have to worry about getting the authority from the Farm Bill to grow hemp anymore. But th that's a good question. Uh, just a quick question. Um, UVA is the one doing the medicinal research, right, for the cannabinoids? Oh, um, UVA is the university doing the cannabinoid research, correct? Yes. Okay, um, I was wondering if you're able to sell the CBD and other cannabinoids after the research, commercially. Um, under the state laws right now, that anything that we do with our research material can only be exploratory and exploratory marketing, and so there's no possibility for sale. Thank you. As I understand. Okay. Um, yes, I had multiple questions. Um, I'm going to keep them brief. I just need to know for clarity, um, because we all want to work hand in hand together. So just for clarity, the process in order for us as farmers or to um, educators to form a co-op, to form a co-op, that's if we're interested in doing that as farmers, as educators, what is the process that we would need to do step by step, even if there's reference material that you can recommend to us, to begin the process so we're not confused on how to push legislation, how to support what it is that we need to do to see the um, legalization of growing industrial hemp here? What do we need to do, clearly? And then my other question would be, um, for exactly what is the qualifying criteria to participate and research at the universities. Just for clarity, what is the absolute qualifying criteria? And sir, you had mentioned about the greenhouse production of industrial hemp for um, research and, and medicinal purposes. I just want to know more about that research. And then if you have any publications that you have published on the outcomes of that research. I'll just briefly talk a little bit about the VIHC, the Virginia Industrial Hemp Coalition, is an advocacy group, we're educational, and we work with the laws, changing the laws. We are not a co-op, we're not a farmer's co-op, um, but I believe, I believe Craig Lee can probably, you know, tell you more about how to do that. I mean, you can go online and get a lot of information, like you said, and figure that out, but it's basically a group of, of farmers coming together and putting their resources together and speaking as one voice and share, maybe sharing equipment, uh, sharing seed purchases, you know, sharing the cost, getting better purchase power, 
um, you know, it's a great thing to do. Um, and with the VIC, as we get, you know, we, we might transition into something more like that, uh, depending on if the membership wants to do something like that. But right now, we're sort of like laser beam focused that the first step in this is getting the laws passed. We can do all this other stuff, but until we get these laws passed, the banking, the insurance, the crop insurance, the big agribusiness, you know, all the, everybody's not going to really get on, fully on board. Yes, well, how do we do that? That's actually what I wanted to know. As far as getting the, get the, the, law, the, the law or the bill passed, oh, to what get, is get exactly passed. do we need to do step by step? Because that's not my area. Okay. So I well, need to know exactly. If you want to get involved with that sort of thing, then that would be great to join our coalition. Okay. Um, it's $25 a year membership. Okay. Um, and then get involved with our group. We have over 250 members. Um, and we are, we're really working on getting these laws, you know, passed for the federal and the state. Um, so that would be something if you're going to do the law stuff, that's kind of more our area. Um, as far as farming co-ops, that's not so much we're into to, into that, but maybe that's something that Craig Lee can, can tell you a little bit about. There's a, let me address that co-op. There's, there's people that will help you put up cooperatives, that will help you form them and set them up. And the cooperatives that's out there today, from my understanding, is a lot more complex than the ones of the past, but they're the ones where you can get government funding, uh, you can get funding from the state, and, and they, but this will help open up the area, and uh, it has to be a strong, organized. The, the one good co-op that's got an example, and they've been about about eight, nine months forming it, and getting it set up strong, and that's North Carolina Bio Region Cooperative. And uh, that's a bio, the, the name of it is Bio Regenerative Cooperative in North Carolina, and they're absolutely moving. That cooperative is moving. And they know how to move a cooperative. Another thing about having a cooperative is the Europeans recognize cooperatives. So if you went to Europe, for an example, and you represented the cooperative, they would have a more chance of talking to you than they would me, Craig Lee, just out here by himself, you know. So this is this is what uh, what makes a cooperative or a coalition so strong in, in doing this. And this is this is where that basically this is where you're going to have to go. You're going to have to go to something like this here, and individual farmers can be members of that cooperative as growers, you know. They just bring it in, and the cooperative is used as a clearinghouse for the product and setting up industry, markets, and different things like that, and be a profitable cooperative, you know, be very profitable. It's just the idea of putting it together and having the strength and the will and no ego, ego skill cooperatives. You know, I want to do this for me. And so the thing that is, it's got to be developed strong, and this is, this is what makes it work. And you can go, you can go forward with a lot. Everything that's been talked here today, everything works a lot better in a cooperative. Yes, everything. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the speakers and our elected officials. I don't know. You want to make a final remarks? I think a lot has already been said. I think everybody uh, understands it's a complicated issue, but that we are all trying to work forward towards it. I, I want to compliment all of y'all. I hope that uh, the research institute at, in, in Danville that Tech has will be used to uh, modify whatever seeds are agreed upon so that we have good quality seeds at the right time. Thank y'all. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Virginia State University for hosting this. I want to say thank you for James Madison University and Virginia Tech for come, and the University of Virginia for coming to share that we are growing as far as those universities that are participating in this process. I hope we've all learned a lot today about the process and the difference between hemp and the other types of marijuanas because for us as legislators, we're dealing with all three. We're dealing with the medicinal, we're dealing with the um, recreational, and we're dealing with the economic part. And that's what we see industrial hemp as the economic uh, branch of the three, was it the three branches on that tree or three, whatever, you, the leaves on that tree, how you might want to see it. So we're dealing with all of that. So we, we've taken a lot, we will take a lot back, but from what I've heard, it's like, First is legislatively, let's get done what we can do at the state and the federal level. And then there will be a need for another field day, or another opportunity for you all to come together and get more information. Because the first step, as I said, is take a break. Don't take a break, stay engaged. 
but watch and be involved in the process that needs to take place now. And that is um, letting your voices be heard with your legislators at the Virginia General Assembly as well as in Congress. It's great to know that we have representatives that are part of the bill that's there in Congress, but it's going to take more than them. The voters matter, we can tell you at the state level, my bosses, uh, the people of the 16th Senatorial District, they make me work tick because I work for them. They don't like my work, I'm no longer the senator from the 16th Senatorial District. So I think it's important that you realize the power that you have to speak out. Speak often, but not too often, because we really want to have time to absorb and, and get some work done. But we are all with you, and uh, proud to have been the one of the two sponsors for the original bill and looking forward to more legislation. And you've heard from us, we are in support, but we all really have to go, and Frank's at the door, and my other friends have already left me, but uh, it was important for us to hear what you all had to say, and now we will try to be like a sponge, hold us in, and then let it out at the right times with our colleagues and in any way we can to support this industrial hemp effort. Thank you for all you do.